you can't see me, I don't think, but I'm, I'm, uh, I hope you can hear me. I'm Kurt Leuschner. And uh, due to technical difficulties, I guess you're not going to see me tonight. But hopefully you'll be able to see our speaker, Phil, later. Um, and I wore a nice shirt and everything. But uh, in any case, I want to, <laughs> I want to welcome you all to um, the first of what we hope are many of these talks on various topics of natural history. Uh, I am the vice president of the Mount San Jacinto Natural History Association. So we're the ones putting on this program. And this is the first in a series. Um, there'll be another one a month from tonight on the 9th of March uh, that I'll be presenting on uh, rare and unusual birds of Mount San Jacinto State Park. Um, the Mount San Jacinto Natural History Association, we support the Mount San Jacinto State Park at the top of the tram and in Idlewild uh, through education, interpretation, and fundraising. And so again, I want to thank you all for tuning in tonight and supporting the NHA as we call it. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about our speaker tonight. He's a good friend of mine and a colleague at College of the Desert. Uh, Phil Parker. Uh, he and I both have um, a number of things in common, including that we both majored in zoology, uh, Phil at Cal Lutheran. Um, but he took a slightly different path. And after his master's in business, he uh, headed to the LAPD for a few years and then transferred to Palm Springs Police Department for 23 years um, in Palm Springs uh, until he Recently, um, he's now teaching at College of the Desert, uh, teaching courses on conservation and natural resources law, enforcement, and administration of justice. Um, he's got three sons. They've all followed in his footsteps and are working in the environmental field. And his wife, Andy, of 39 years in Palm Springs. Um, he volunteers for um, the Mount San Jacinto Natural History Association, of course, he's on our board of directors, and he's also involved with the Desert Cities Bird Club, the Friends of the Desert Mountains, and Sunnylands, among other organizations in the Valley. So that's a little bit about Phil. Um, tonight, he's going to be talking about the pronghorn antelope. Um, there are few animals more iconic in the American West and the pronghorn antelope, the fastest animal in North America, incredibly curious and highly adapted to its environment. His talk tonight um, is going to describe this so-called ghost of the desert, the Sonoran pronghorn antelope. And he's gonna go over a, a brief history of the pronghorns in the US, including historic and current ranges. And then he's gonna share some exciting news about a reintroduction program to bring pronghorn, I mean, pronghorns back to the Chuckwalla bench area. So he'll explain where that area is. So with that, I wanna welcome Phil Parker and hand it over to him and remind you all that you can type questions into the chat at any time and I'll monitor those. And at the end of the talk, we'll do our best to get those answered by Phil. So type any questions you might have or comments into the chat and I'll watch for those. Um, so. Um, let's give Phil a nice round of applause and welcome him. Phil Parker. Thank you so much, Kurt. I really do appreciate it. Um, hello to everybody and welcome to our first Get in Touch with Nature program that we're going to provide via Zoom until we can all meet together again and do presentations face to face. How much fun will that be? Um, I, like you, I don't know if you guys know as much about pronghorn antelope as I knew about them and I knew a little about them and I've seen one or two and which was exciting. However, I didn't really know all there was until I was able to, talk, to do some research and then talk to a couple folks that these really are fascinating creatures. Um, and so our, our title here is Welcome or Welcome Back. And I know that a bunch of you are out there are thinking we don't have pronghorn in the Coachella Valley, because um, that's exactly what I said. But I am going to show you something different that may open your mind a little bit. So 
what are we talking about? We're talking about a pronghorn antelope and they get their name from this. Their horns grow up into two little sections like this into a prong. Um, and this is what looks like an antelope. It's an Antelocapra americana. That is the genus and species in North America here. Um, it, I guess, as Kurt said, it's an icon of the West along with the bison. Um, there were large herds all across North America. And I'll show you a map in a little bit here. Um, they're called, referred to as a ghost of the desert because they would just appear and then they would disappear, um, which is kind of fun. Um, this, here's the really fun thing though. They're not really an antelope. They are in a family all by themselves. They look like they have the, the thin legs, they run really fast like an antelope, but they're not really an antelope. They are genetically different. Um, there's something about their horns as well. They shed their horns every year. I know there's a bunch of folks out there who are very knowledgeable and go, wait, 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 wait. Horns don't, you don't drop horns, you drop antlers. These, this part of the horn that grows up here is actually a sheath that grows over the horn that stops somewhere in there, right? It grows out of the skull as a horn. And then this part grows in as a sheath that fits over it and then is shed each year. These are fascinating animals. They do weird things. Um, currently, there are several, there's, there's five subspecies. Historically, there were 20 plus subspecies and I'll show you where their range was. And some of those, they, they can, we have archeological um, studies that show that they've been around since about the Pleistocene. And they've been as small, some of the subspecies were as small as two feet tall and some of them were six feet tall. Whew. Okay, so what's their range? This map shows you in the tan here, this up here, all the way up into Canada, these are, these are flat plains area of Canada. Um, as a, was that Montana, Colorado, Nebraska, all the way down into Texas, middle, almost all of Texas, but at least the middle of Texas, way down here in the middle of, of Mexico, almost Mexico City, almost all of Mexico, Utah, um, and most of Nevada. And look at this. Central Valley of California and all of Southern California. That's their historic range. Now, the current ranges of the five different subspecies, most are up in this area here. And then you have these little islands all around here. Notice there's nothing in California at this point. Baja California, Baja California, and then Southern, uh, Southern Arizona. Um, but no populations in California. In, in their historic ranges that we have um, history or readings that we've read from, from explorers that talk about hundreds of pronghorn antelope running through the, uh, running through the, the plains area, hunting them down. Um, and it's just to tell the large, large numbers by himself. So um, I was in New Mexico. We went to visit our son there. So what made the changes? What happened? Why did we break up their ranges into these small little islands all around? Well, first we built roads. We started out with uh, trails that went through. We got the, the Oregon Trail, the Santa Fe Trail that goes right through this area um, and a few other of the famous ones from uh, 1800s. But we built roads which and they, they're hesitant, like a lot of animals, you know, there's something new, they, they'll still shy away from it. Um, of course, now with cars, that, that makes it um, very dangerous for them as well. Um, and like Kurt said, these are the fastest animals in North America. They are, they've been clocked at 55 miles per hour, <sighs> freeway speeds, incredible. But they don't jump very well. So when we build fences, even short fences, four or five feet, they they are, it's very difficult for them, a very effective barrier to keep them in certain areas or away from certain areas. They were out competed by grazing animals and tons and tons of sheep. Also, one of the reasons that we put fences up, we wanted to keep those two apart as well. And there's a lot of history involved with that. But that they 
the, the grazing creatures that we have here, the sheep and the cattle, um, outcompeted the uh, pronghorn on their own. Yeah, we talked about um, how fast do they run? 55. They like the open grasslands, the open ranges. I like this picture of grazing the, the, the tops of the flowers and that's how much fun is that. In their his history, their biggest threat was a wolf. Now, I don't know about you, but um, most of us know that most, if not all the wolves, especially in North America, except for those that were reintroduced, to them naturally right now is the coyote and the coyote is not a threat to any adult uh, antelope it's a threat to the to the newborns uh, rather quickly um, within a, within a few hours so there is a narrow window but coyotes do know and they do hang out and when they start lambing and they start having their babies then the coyotes have an opportunity and that can happen overall though biggest threat is us We've, we've built roads, we've built buildings, we've made cities, we've hunted, we've done all these things to keep them in very small numbers and, and make those numbers very, very small. Um, and so we are, again, the biggest threat. There we go. So there's a bit of push. There was a push, it's been a number of years, pronghorn in and hello to California. And several groups have been working together. Oh, let's go back, all right. So they wanna mitigate this. They know that they, they can have them. They wanna reintroduce them into the wild and, and have populations of pronghorn antelope that uh, got together to, to make decisions, formulate plans, secure funding, obtain necessary permits and permissions, which if any of you have worked with any part of the United States government or the United States military, you know that that takes a very long time. There are experts at building the red tape. Biologist Kevin Clark, which I hope is a part of this, I hope he's here. Um, he and his colleagues have been working since the early 2000s on this program. Um, he works with the San Diego Natural History Museum and is part of several conservation and preservation projects. Um, he got involved with the project in the early 2000s, like I said, and by 2011, it had progressed to a point where the, they were scouting where are we going to do this? Where are we going to re re reintroduce them? And so he was scouting several different places. He went to Arizona. He went to Mexico. He went all over the place looking for just the right place and chose the Chuck Walla bench. Chuck Walla bench, what they're, the, the species, the subspecies that they're looking for is specifically the Sonoran sub subspecies, which is slightly smaller, a little lighter in color um, than the than the other um, species of pronghorn antelope. And it's genetic. And it's a current and ongoing process. Again, that was, they were scouting and working on this stuff in the early 2000s to the 2011s. And here we are 10 years later, and it's a current still going project. They're still trying to make things happen. And we'll touch on that in just a little bit just like this little guy that says hi. All right, so why the Chuck Walla bench? They surveyed all the best possible habitats. They came up with a few things, like there's few or no roads. One of the worst things to happen is to have roadkill. Um, we don't want that. So in the Chuck Walla bench area, which I'll show you in a little bit, I'll show you a map, um, there are few or no roads. Um, there are few structures. It's relatively pristine. Now it's not quite, but it's relatively pristine desert wilderness. Um, and there's a whole population of mule deer that survive quite well out there, all thrive. And then certainly the pronghorn can that are highly adapted to open prairie and desert areas. And here we go. 
So where is the Chuck Walla bench? Well, the easiest answer is right behind this sign. This, the Chuck Walla Mountains here or right there with the um, chocolate and Oracopia Mountains, uh, little Chuck Walla Mountains in here. You see uh, Joshua Tree is on this side of I-10. I-10 runs right through it. Desert Center is out here. That gives you an idea of where we're looking. Salton Sea is out here. Um, Scirocco Summit. So all those places are a little, are, are um, seeing you go, okay, got an idea. And you see here, this, all of this in the stripe, that's area critical environment concern. These are all things we're concerned about, right? National conservation lands are in the light green. Wilderness is in the dark green. This is great. This is where you want to put those, uh, that wild uh, population of pronghorn. Military reservations. Military is in here as well. This is an aerial gunnery range. So you guys probably already know, but um, Bombay Beach and Salton Sea, which is, should be right underneath the sign there, the little, the, the legend here. Um, it was called that because as pilots were practicing for dropping bombs in World War II, they would practice down in this area and they would use Bombay Beach as their visual line of sight to go, okay, this is when I open my Bombay doors and then drop the bombs right over here in the artillery gun range. So it took them just a minute or two to get from here to there long enough for the doors to open slowly, get the bombs lined up and they would drop them right at the base of the Chuck Walla Mountains here. This is also where Patton in this whole area, this is where Patton trained his uh, tank crew and his army groups for battling and fighting in the in the desert areas of, of Africa. That would they were they were trying to look for something similar that they can work on their their strategies and this was the place. So that was probably one of the key things that sent the very last small populations of pronghorn that were there in historic ranges um, out the out the window in the late 1930s and 40s and sent them away. Um, yep. Okay. We talked about that. We're good here. Oh, right now, we don't have a lot of military training, although there are military bases still down there. Um, but one of the biggest threats to this area is the pro proposition of starting um, solar farms. They want large areas of open, air, open land to put up solar farms, which on the surface and having a sustainable source of energy is not that bad, but it does keep wild animals from wandering through it. And it, 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 it keeps breaking up those territories. Um, who's doing all this? Who's, who are the groups involved in all this? Number one is the military. And I don't know about you, it might be a counterintuitive to you, but it, is, it certainly was to me. But I know that a lot of conservation and preservation programs. The military has been involved in a lot of them around the world where they are one of the biggest landowners in the United States. And so they're very involved in conservation and preservation of a lot of different groups. And so this is one of them and they, they are on board. They do wanna be part of this program. They do wanna reintroduce pronghorn into the, into the ranges that they own as well. So they, they are a big part of this and a big stakeholder. The um, U.S. Army's down here in the U.S. Navy. For oh, the other one, Bureau of Land Management. There's their patch. They're, and they're also on board and they have signed agreements and they, they are talking to people and they're part of this. There's, they've been sitting at the table again for almost 20 years and since the early 2000s. Um, state fish, federal, state and federal fish and wildlife services, the state fish and wildlife, and the, the U.S. fish and wildlife services definitely involved. And then there are some private groups. This is going to be counterintuitive as well. The Safari Club is a hunting club, and it it introduced pronghorn into the area. They have volunteers that want to set up bubblers, they want to do they want to do more and they want to conserve and reintroduce this a population of pronghorn to the area. Now they might want to at some point um, hunt them as well. 
but uh, Safari Club, Ducks Unlimited, and a whole bunch of other hunting groups, although their ultimate goal is maybe different than some of the other just preservation groups, they have done, they've put, spent a lot of money, they've spent a lot of time, a lot of effort on a lot of conservation programs. And so they are a, a, a stakeholder and they're at the table of decision makers as well. Desert Wildlife Unlimited in the, the south end of uh, Coachella Valley is deeply involved. And they're, they're involved in, in uh, preserving wilderness areas out there. And where are we gonna get these pronghorn? Specifically, if we're looking at a, a specific subspecies that is a, highly adapted and specifically adapted to a desert area. How do we find those now that we, we, we are clearly and we understand that they're highly endangered, but where do we find them? And we look in Arizona to COFA National Wildlife Refuge. COFA has a population and they're in pens, but um, as um, Kevin, the, the biologist I mentioned before, as Kevin mentioned to, to me, is the pens aren't you know, like a dog pen or a dog run or something. These are huge. These are a mile by a mile or, or even more that these large pens where they have a small population of pronghorns that are specifically, um, they're watched and, and noted and, and researched so that they, when they start having babies, they can take those children and they can move them to places that need to, to replenish and repopulate um, and, and keep that genetic diversity going as well. So this is, this is already in place. This is one of those things that they have an agreement, at least a handshake agreement where, okay, when we get all of our permissions and, and permits in order, then we'll go to the Kofa National Wildlife Refuge and we'll get some children there, or we'll go to the Cabeza Prieta, which is in a similar situation, very large pens, small population, and we'll look for those, those babies that we can bring out here and start the new population in the Chapala Bench area. Keep partners going forward, the living desert. Living deserts involved, and I know that there's a lot of discussion out there. Um, I think most of the people in this in this uh, arena might love the living desert, which of course we all do. But there are a lot of folks out there who go, there shouldn't be zoos. There, you're locking up an animal that should be wild and they have large ranges and all that sort of stuff. But they don't understand, they don't realize what the kinds of things that the living desert is doing. Number one, they're educating people. There's a, there's a large population of people who would never see um, animals that, that live in other parts of the world and live it even in this desert, they would never see them. Um, and so there's an education uh, part to it. And then there is the preservation and conservation that they're doing with zoos all around the world that working in projects like this one where they are providing their expertise on the knowledge of the animal. And then they're the, like the living desert has the, the genetic books where they can keep and they say, okay, we don't want two or three more animals from this particular area because their genetics um, signature is so similar. We want diversity, we're gonna go somewhere else. They're very key and in, in, uh, partner in this kind of thing. And they're really looking forward to being part of that as it goes forward. Desert Wildlife Unlimited, again, this young lady giving the thumbs up, can't wait to be part of it. There's a, there's a volunteer crew there. There's um, some um, expertise and, and they're, 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 they know the area really well and they work on the pens and, and a lot of different parts as part of what uh, the Desert Wildlife Unlimited is offering. And the San Diego Safari Park, not the zoo, but the Safari Park. And, they, and once again, another type of zoo and, an, and an, one that's really innovative in how they represent and show their, the animals that are out there. And it's, it's, again, highly educational. They are very innovative in their um, education departments. Uh, my son got his master's through a, a program through with San Diego Safari Park. And they have a, a series of experts. They offer a lot of expertise on capturing and transporting animals. We're trying to keep that stress level really, really low because it certainly stresses them. They think they're going to get eaten. 
Um, so you want to try really hard to keep them calm. You want to keep them um, very, the, the stress levels really, really low so that when you do release them, they're not panicked. They haven't hurt themselves, all of those kind of things. So they have that expertise and they have that knowledge and they can help with those kind of things as well as how do you keep uh, a wild population within certain parameters and borders. There you go. Um, resources, resources as well. How do you capture a, a wild animal and drive it to a, a you know across a border or fly it from one place to another um, without how do, how do you do that? You don't put it in the back seat of a car, right? There are things that you can do. There are they have they have the resources to help that help with those kind of things. Now, I know there's a bunch of you out there who are going, this sounds like a lot of fun. I want to be a part of this. I can put fences up. I can help with putting in water. Um, I would love to be out there and maybe help capture a wild um, pronghorn, put it in, a, in a, a cage or put it in a box. We'll get it to another place. We'll release it. How much fun would it be to release it in its new home? Oh, that would be great. Can I volunteer? Is there a place I can look at and say, okay, I want to see when it comes up? And no, there's not yet. Um, what I, it was explained to me, Kevin shared that it's, as you well know, as you folks know, you've been involved in things and you know that you have to get government has layer after layer after layer after layer that you have to go through. So you turn in all the right paperwork, you got a stack of uh, forms you have to fill out just the right way, and you go through that lower layer, and it gets stamped and signed and goes to the next layer, gets stamped and signed, goes to the next layer, etc, etc, etc. And that's kind of where they're at. They're at that hurry up and wait stage, where they're waiting for people, for the right people to, to sign things in place now that is making noises like they would support um, projects like this, <clears throat> excuse me, that that um, the signatures will come relatively quickly now, but you just never know. So they're hurry up and waiting, they're checking on things. In the meantime, um, Living Desert, watch the Living Desert on their social media watch on their Facebook page, watch them, watch them on their Twitter. If you do the Twitter, um, any of their websites, the Natural History Association, of course, so that when we get permission and we are alerted, we'll certainly put that out. I am absolutely positive. And then uh, any of the other, so the San Diego Safari Park. Um, I doubt the military is gonna put that out where you might be, but you that might be an avenue if you are a, a veteran and you have uh, access to those kind of things, that might be something that would show up as well. Certainly the Safari Club and the Desert Wildlife Unlimited as well. So all of that to say is that the historic ranges of the pronghorn antelope certainly included this area and in all of Southern California, down into Mexico and all of Baja, Mexico. Right now, there's just tiny little populations. This is this project has been going on for quite a while, but it is the beginning of repopulating and rewilding of the pronghorn antelope to this and other areas. So are we welcoming them or are we welcoming them back? And I'm certainly we're welcoming them back. So thank you so much for watching. We got to run. And we're now open for any questions that you might have. I'll leave this up or I can escape whichever you'd like to do, Kurt. Hi, I'm back. Um, thank you so much, Phil. Um, there's a couple of questions coming in. Can you hear me, Phil? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Also, um, so participants should be able to unmute themselves now. So if you did wanna ask a question or make a comment, in person and not in the chat, that might be possible as well. Just remember to unmute yourself. Um, but one of the questions actually was my question. I was wondering what these pronghorn might be eating out there in the wild because the desert's pretty sparse when it comes to plants. Do you have any idea what, what their favorite food plants might be? 
Well, and like I said, the mule deer are, are thriving out there. So whatever they're eating, uh, and I would suspect it would be um, the, uh, I had it before I started, um, brittle bush and those kind of things, and maybe even types of cactus. We know that the bighorn eat cactus. So um, bighorn are out there, they're, and mule deer. So if they can thrive, and I'm, whatever they're eating, the, the pronghorn can as well. My information says mesquites, cat's claws, jojoba, buckwheat, grasses, cactus, and agave. Okay. All of that stuff's out there, isn't it? It sure is. <laughs> I'm, I'm just thinking with climate change, you know, it's drier than ever out there. So I'm wondering if this is even a good time to be reintroducing them out into the desert, but I guess they've got to try. Um, Another question, Phil, is about the Chuckwalla Bench location and would it be fenced like the pens? My understanding is that there would be pens that would be there for the introduction phase. So you would bring young animals from, from a COFA or a Cabeza Prieta and then bring them over here and keep them in a, a pen for a short period of time for a kind of a, uh, what is it, a quarantine or to get acclimated and then there'll be a release into the wild. Okay. Um, yeah, it's, I mean, that Chuckwalla bench area is huge. So I mean, there's no way they're gonna fence the whole thing. Um, Another question is how many pairs, how many pairs might be brought in to establish them? What, what kind of numbers are we talking about here? Yeah, and I didn't get any of that information. I think it's the, the, they're working on those, those kind of numbers and those kind of decisions. But I, and I think it's kind of depends on what's available as well. So yeah. I, I not, I'm not sure on that answer. Yeah. Yeah, I, I imagine it's not that many at a time, but they also want to have a, a core population. Um, and what about the gestation period? And mm -hmm. like, how many are they having at a time and gestation? Any, any ideas on those? Usually it's one at a time. Yeah. It, it, usually one at a time, very rarely we have uh, twins. The uh, gestation, I would be a guess but it's just a few months, I'm sure. So um, if there's any other questions, feel free to, un again, unmute yourself and ask them now. Um, but again, I want to thank Phil for uh, kicking off this lecture series and um, remind everybody to tune in in a month from now to hear about some birds, and then we'll continue on with other topics every month. So on behalf of the Natural History yeah, Association, just want to thank everybody for attending and thank you, Phil, for this presentation on pronghorn. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed it. Hope we can do it again. Thank you and good night, everybody. Phil, uh, you still there? Kurt's still here. I'll hang around for a little while. Yeah. You know, I have a question. Uh, was maybe something that could uh, be answered by somebody that breeds cattle. But if you bring uh, just a captive group in with just limited genetic uh, markers or whatever you want to call them, uh, would the herd somewhere on the line uh, be compromised? I know they're talking about the uh, mountains out here, you know, towards Temecula, where uh, you know, so limited inbreeding, and I guess the question has to go into, as the herd builds up, uh, they would have to, would they not have to bring in other genetically different uh, pronghorns from another herd? Uh, could you hear that? Yes, too? absolutely, and, and that is where... Uh, Yes, sir. And that's that's yeah. that's where the living desert expertise and the San Diego Safari Park would come in because they have
contacts with zoos around the world and other organizations around the world that might have um, the, the Sonoran subspecies as well. And then like I say, would keep that genetic uh, diversity going. And that is a key concern for them as well. So you're absolutely right that that's one of the things that they need to think about. Thank you. Anybody else have a question? We're still here, some of us are. Hey, Phil, what's the, what's the timing? When, when do you think they might introduce some pairs? Is it this year, next year? What's, what's the timing of this project? Well, I, I asked him, uh, Kevin, this, and he, if he had an idea, and he says it's, it's in the paperwork that's in Washington, D.C., and they're hurry up and waiting. And so they really don't know. But what they're trying to do is to line everything up so that as soon as they get that stamp and signature, then they can just push the go button and everybody gets busy. So that would be the thing to watch for. It could be in this year, it could be next year, it could be five years from now. Um, it depends on Washington, DC. Um, but it is something to watch for now. You can put it on that on your, your radar, if you will, and watch all the social media, because I'm sure that once everything gets stamped, they're going to put the word out and say, OK, can you help us bid, build pens? Can you help us build water, water holes? Can you can you help us out? And I'm sure that they'll have a, an army of people wanting to help out. <laughs> Any other questions? All right, what do we got in the chat? Got that, got that. 235 days gestation. Very good. I got a quick question. Uh, yes, sir. <laughs> I, I apologize if I missed this part. Um, my, in, my own internet was, was com, uh, cutting in and out as well, but it, when they, with the reintroduction, are they um, planning on doing any kind of connectivity between uh, the open spaces that are existing in the moment, like you said, with the the BLM lands and the uh, military lands, is there some way that they can kind of connect these where there's an open range, I guess is the be better way to put it for gen genetic flow? Yeah, and good, good question, because that's why there's so many stakeholders involved is because there's private property in, involved. Colin and, and Cindy know this very, very well. There's private property, there's private organizations involved, like the Safari Club and some others. But then um, there's also the military and there's BLM and there's state and federal. There's all these different stakeholders and they all have to agree that says, yeah, let them roam freely here. We won't build anything here. We won't put a fence there. So they have to come to the table. They have to sit down and discuss. And all of this has to be written out and everybody has to sign it. And my understanding is at least on a handshake level that has been in or is in place. And that is they're just waiting for Washington DC to give the stamp of approval and then they can just start doing. So that's a very good question. You're absolutely right. And that is a can has been a concern. All right, any others? I think, um, Bert, are you still uh, with us? I'm still here. Are you still here? Yes. <laughs> All right. I think the questions are are over. Well, I got a question for Kurt. Uh, Kurt, do you have a definite date as to when you're going to be talking about the birds? Yeah, that's a month from tonight, so that should be March 9th. Okay, thank you. Dave, you are going for second Tuesday of the month. Okay. Or yeah, second Tuesday, March 9th. Same time, six o'clock. Mm -hmm. 
And I assume you pick up from this uh, list uh, you know, to notify us. Well, Joe can comment on that, but we'll send out a reminder to anybody who's a member of the NHA and, and I hope that anybody who's tuned in tonight. Everybody that's uh, signed on for the lecture tonight will get a notice for okay. all the upcoming meetings, yeah. as well as uh, a wider, much wider uh, mailing list as, as, as well. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, you'll be, at, you'll be well informed, well in advance, and you'll have plenty of opportunity to uh, put that onto your schedule. And okay, thank you. So I think we can conclude our meeting tonight. Uh, seems to be we've had some good questions and uh, appreciate it very much. So those of the you who are remaining, uh, we hope to see you again the next time in uh, one month on a second Tuesday of March. So with that, unless anybody else has a comment before we close, uh, any further comments? Thank you, Phil. Thank you. Thank you. Thank okay, you. Well, thank you all. We appreciate it. Look forward to the next time. Good night.